I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where I speak with creative entrepreneurs, artists, and other insanely interesting people to hear their stories, learn about their molding moments, tipping points, and spectacular takeoffs. Upwork has the world's largest network of independent professionals. So if you need a go-to designer, a video editor, or a social media specialist for six days or six months, Upwork is how. And it's basically like they're right here in your office. Except they're not here here, so they can't hear Greg's remarkably loud typing. Hey, buddy! I take it back. You can hear that from anywhere. And Upwork professionals are proven, rated, and reviewed. When you need in-demand talent on demand, Upwork is how. In this episode of The Unmistakable Creative, I speak with Mason Curry. In an effort to understand his personal optimal rhythm and flow, Mason set out to amass as much information as he could to find out about the routines that brilliant and successful creators adopted and followed. The result of his research was a book titled Daily Rituals, How Artists Work. Mason, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for, for taking the time to join us. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you here. You know, I came across your work by, by way of two sites. Uh, one was Brain Pickings. The other was uh, Tim Ferriss' blog, which, you know, of course, probably anybody listening to this knows. But uh, really, I mean, it, I was intrigued by it because I think anybody listening to this considers themselves an artist, and, and we all kind of have our rituals. And so that, you know, made me very curious about your story and, and kind of what led you to this book. So uh, tell us a, a bit about yourself, your background, and, uh, you know, how that has led you to creating this book. Uh, yeah, sure thing. Um, and, and thank you for the kind words. I, um, I, I was an English major in college, and uh, by the time I graduated, I decided that I um, wanted to be a writer of some kind, um, although it's taken me a while to figure out exactly what kind of writer, and I, I still feel like I'm still kind of figuring it out. Um, <laughs> but I, as I think a lot of people who try to do creative work uh, have found, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a struggle to to figure out wh- how you do your own work, you know, kind of what your best working method is. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I- I've always been the kind of person who needs to have a um, kind of a settled daily routine in my own life in order to be um, kind of stay on an even keel and, and be productive and-, and get things done. And um, I've always wanted to be a writer of some kind. So as a result, I've really been drawn to these stories of how other successful creative people have um, scheduled their days and, and what their working habits were. And so, um, you know, anytime I've been reading biographies or, uh, or obituaries or newspaper profiles of people, I've always seized on these details about how they uh, organize their days. And so at one point, uh, several years ago, um, I had the idea that someone should start collecting these stories in one place. And um, I looked around and there didn't seem to be anything like that. So I started a blog um, kind of just grabbing these stories anytime I ran across them, really just more for myself than for anyone else, just kind of as a way to keep track of them mm-hmm. and um, a- as a hobby. And then after a few years, uh, the blog kind of got some attention. I had sort of this moment where it was being passed around a lot, and I got a lot of readers. And um, I got some emails from uh, literary agents and uh, book editors suggesting that I expand the idea into a book. And, you know, honestly, at that point, I was thinking, boy, maybe this could be like a magazine story or something. Mm -hmm. I I hadn't really thought that this could be a book. But um, uh, after talking to them, I, I, you know, saw that this was a great opportunity. And um, so the Daily Rituals book is the ultimate result of, of that project. No, I, so this is interesting, really. You know, I think one of the things people are going to hear this and then think, "Wow, this sounds like a real Cinderella story." But I think you and I both know that's not true. Um, so I, I actually want to start earlier than this book and really dig into sort of the earlier part of your career. I mean, you said you know you knew in college that you wanted to be a writer, and I think that many of us, uh, especially those who choose to pursue creative work, we kind of have this inkling of, "Hey, I want to be a writer." I mean. When I was in college, it was like I would love more than anything in the world to be a writer, but I'm going to go get a sales job because I have no idea how the hell anybody is going to pay me to be a writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk to me about uh, the struggles uh, and kind of talk to me about the early days of your career. I mean kind of what has led you to being able to make a living as a working artist and and the things that have been challenging and and kind of molded you. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean when I graduated from college, I decided – 
that I wanted to be a novelist. Um, and so I thought the way to be a novelist was to get a day job, some kind of nine to five job that would pay the bills and then write in your sp spare time. So um, that I managed to do the day job part. I got a job at a library, a, a university library. Um, actually, it wasn't a nine to five job. The hours were all over the place because we were opening and closing the library. And then my plan was to write a novel in my spare time. But uh, that part <laughs> proved to be more difficult than I anticipated. Um, I was sort of constantly flailing around. I would write kind of the first chapter of something and then scrap it and then write the first chapter of something else. And after a couple of years, it was like the day job was progressing. I was getting little promotions. I was kind of moving up in the library. And I, I suddenly realized, like, this is not working. I felt like I needed something to push me to write other than just this fantasy of being a novelist. And um, I I started thinking about maybe going into being an editor uh, in the magazine world because I thought, well, at least that way I will be working with writers. Um, I'll, I'll be forced to do some writing on the job. And um, I, also at the time, a lot of what I was really interested in reading was um, more kind of like long form nonfiction. Um, I kind of decided that, that I wasn't so interested in being a novelist. So I sort of took the opposite approach then. I went from thinking that you had to just have a day job to pay the bills and you had to do your creative work on the side to trying to find a job that would pay the bills but also let me do something kind of creative and, and writing related um, as part of that job. So I, um, I found this program in New York uh, at Columbia University, a summer program called the Columbia Publishing Course. Um, it's like a six-week kind of crash course in the publishing industry, uh, both books and magazines. And I did that, and out of that I got a job um, as an assistant to the publisher of a small um, architecture and design magazine called Metropolis. And... Um, Luckily, the editors there were, were kind of happy to have an eager young person uh, who would help them write things and edit things, and I managed to kind of work my way up the ladder there and uh, get some editing and writing experience. So, um, you know, that, that kind of worked out, the idea of, of moving to New York and being a magazine editor and writing. It, it worked out, but it still wasn't completely creatively fulfilling, and so... Um, this daily routines, daily rituals, side project kind of... Um, was, like I said, a hobby, but it also kind of fulfilled some of this desire to do something a little bit more um, kind of outside of the realm of this magazine world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I've just been very lucky that it has turned into a kind of viable uh, side project. You know, it was a side project. I worked full-time the entire time that I was um, putting the book together, mm -hmm. and only now the book is out have I been able to um, kind of make a go as a freelance writer and editor. So it's definitely a long process. And I, I uh, you know, it's, it's funny being interviewed about these things. Cause it's not like I feel like I've figured it out in any way <laughs> <laughs> or that I'm a good model necessarily for other people. But I do, I do think it's encouraging, at least for me to hear about how other people kind of uh, figure this stuff out. So hopefully it's, it's somewhat useful to your listeners. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that that's, that's always kind of the, the you know, million dollar question is like, well, you know, is there a formula? And, you know, I, I've always said there isn't, there can't be, because I mean, every, if, if there was a cookie cutter formula, then our show would be pretty useless. Uh, but you know, it, it's interesting. So there, there's two things that you said there that I actually want to dig into in a bit more depth. Um, you know, you mentioned this idea of finding something that would push you to write. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people probably don't have the option to say, you know what, I'm going to go and, and, you know, enroll in a program at Columbia. But I think that finding whatever that is that will push them, whether it's writing, whether it's something that, you know, is just something they're burning to do. I mean, whatever that creative endeavor it is, you, how, you think it's, it's possible. Like, how do you find that? I mean, how do you find that thing that pushes you to the edge where you're like, I have to do this project? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because you know putting the book the book together, I was really struck by how many of these artists in the book have this real fire inside to create and are really driven and, and kind of obsessed by their work. And um, you know, I sort of have this question of you know, is it possible to to find a creative path when you don't necessarily know what that thing is that you want to be doing and, and you don't have this kind of uh, this drive toward this one uh, form of expression. So, um, I, I mean, I think in my case, 
the magazine world was a good one because it's a world driven by deadlines and it was really useful for me to have to have to write about something in a certain time frame and to kind of learn some of those basic uh journalistic chops you know of 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 writing on deadline and at a certain length and uh, getting used to being edited and uh, those were all really useful skills and i think kind of snapped me out of this idea that i had after graduating from college which was oh you know writing is about like doing it by yourself and not dealing with sort of the workaday world. And um, it's this sort of pure artistic expression. I think, you know, there's some middle ground there. And for people who are having trouble starting like a writing project, I think if you can find a way to have a deadline or have somebody breathing down your neck, um, that can be a huge help. Uh, mm-hmm. you know. it's, it's interesting. You know, what, I, what I'm hearing when I'm, I'm, you know, hearing you describe this process is putting in constraints, you know, and, and creative people yeah. hate constraints, right? Like for most of us, like, well, that sounds really restricting. I mean, what do you do with that? I, 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 it's, <clears throat> it's one of those things, though, that I think that has, has taught me a lot. I mean, part of why I've always said, you know, our show is one hour, it's taught me to say, okay, I have to accomplish everything I need to do within an hour conversation. Hmm. And that's been tremendously useful in sort of shaping uh, how I approach things, and I think that it's, I think there, there's one of the challenges I see with writers in general is it's actually a lot harder to be concise than it is to, to write lengthy stuff. Mm, yeah, that's an interesting observation. I think that is true. Yeah, like it's so much harder to write like a like a really good two or three hundred word thing than to just take as much time as you need. Yeah, that's very true. And I think the thing you're saying about constraints is very true too. That um, you know, you need something. You can't just. <laughs> You can't just be like, like, I mean, my whole problem was, you know, I was 22 and I'm like, I'm going to write a novel. And it's like, you just, there was no, I didn't have anything to focus it in on. I think partly I didn't have enough like life experience to really have something worth writing about, but also partly it was too open, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's been really valuable for me to, uh, kind of be forced into some different kind of, uh, formats and, and into some different, um, avenues where there were some real restrictions. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do this. I, I want to talk about your time at the magazine because I think that, you know, you, you mentioned that a lot of the lessons that have come from that. I think that one of the things that many of us don't get uh, as creatives and as people who write um, is that sort of training from the world of traditional journalism or magazines because, you know, we're all sort of, you know, we live in our choose-yourself era. We're like, hey, I can just put up a blog and I can start writing. And, of mm-hmm. course, we all know, well, that doesn't mean it's going to be any good. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm very curious, you know, what lessons that you have brought from that world that have really applied to this whole, you know, daily rituals project, Uh, but also, you know, sort of dealing with the fact that you you knew that you were doing something that would probably lead to to this, but you also knew that that wasn't, you know, creatively fulfilling you and and how you balance those two things, because I I would imagine that, you know, if if I were to start a creative job and I can tell you one of the things that I think really kept me um, in the early days of my life from pursuing a creative career was that I knew I was going to have to start out by doing work that honestly wasn't all that interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm very curious kind of what that experience was like for you. Yeah, I I guess, you know, I went into the magazine world thinking it was going to be creatively fulfilling and it was, it was, it was sort of, and it sort of wasn't, you know, it's like, you're always kind of, you get into one thing and then you feel like you could be, doing a little better (laughs) or that you could, that there's another level to get to. So at first it was very satisfying to, um, you know, be writing and editing for a paycheck. I thought that was really great and I really enjoyed it. And I learned a lot about, um, you know, how to edit people's work. And I think that was really valuable for my own writing. Um, but then at a certain point, you know, putting out a magazine is very much a formula. Um, you're often kind of doing variations of the same thing. And, um, this magazine was in a, on a topic of architecture and design that I'm interested in, but it's not the only thing I'm interested in. And, um, you know, it kind of leaves, there's a, there's a lot of stuff you can't do in, in that world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of quickly found myself wanting to, to do some other stuff as well. Um, so I don't know. Am I answering your question? What, what kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to some degree, I mean, I guess, you know, to me, like lessons that you, you've applied in this project, I mean, which you've talked about editing, which is tremendously useful, but I, I think you brought up a really interesting point, uh, that I think is worth digging a bit deeper into. I and mean, you said that you thought, you know, writing for a paycheck could be, uh, really creatively fulfilling. And it's funny because I, I look at almost every freelance writing gig I've had 
and I realized I got paid to write. That was the least fulfilling uh, <laughs> writing from a creative perspective that I ever did until I did my book. And yeah, I got paid for that, but I didn't know I was going to get paid for that. And yet there was something much more rewarding uh, about doing that work than there ever was for gigs where I knew I was getting paid to write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It's like uh, at, at first it was it was just wonderful to be getting paid to do something that I found interesting and, and somewhat creatively rewarding. But um, but I know what you mean. It's like the stuff you do for money kind of gets too tangled up in paying the bills and 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 the stuff that you're doing for yourself, which often doesn't pay, is the really rewarding stuff. Um, so I mean, I think that the dream would be to find the job that is creatively fulfilling and that also pays the bills, but that those are incredibly rare. <laughs> So I think a lot of people end up doing this kind of juggling act that you're talking about. You know, uh, that was certainly my case. You're doing something that's kind of creatively fulfilling and pays the bills or kind of pays the bills. And then you're kind of constantly trying to find these other outlets that um, are maybe more interesting and less uh, less remunerative. Yeah, no, I, I think that this, this actually, that, that makes a perfect setup for my next question. Um, you know, people have asked me, it's like, okay, well, now you get to do this full time. And, and there was a lot of freelance work that led up to this, most of which I found incredibly unfulfilling. So I guess for me, the question really is, is you know, you've talked about a juggling act, and I kind of see it as building a bridge between those two things, right? Is mm. okay, This is the work I have to do to pay the bills. This is the work that I have to do because I have to do it. Like, there's just this burning desire. And I'm wondering, you know, what, if people are in that situation, how they build a bridge between those two things. And you got to remember, some people probably in their regular jobs are not even doing creative work that they're getting paid for or, you know, even, it, like, indirectly could lead to this. They have to basically treat it as a completely separate project. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely know that. And there are people in my research in the book who, you know, face that very dilemma, which was how to do creative work while earning a living on the side. And um, and those were some of my favorite stories because I felt like I was doing the same thing. You know, I was um, working on the book in the early morning and then I would like eat breakfast, take a shower and go off to my day job and have a normal eight or nine hour day. Um, I like that idea of trying to build a bridge between the two things. Um, I think it depends on what your kind of creative interest is. Uh, you know, I think there are some creative projects that probably are never going to, <laughs> this is sort of a <laughs> depressing line of uh, thought, but that there are some creative projects that you probably aren't going to make a living off of. And, and I think maybe just as equally valid of an approach is trying to find a, a day job or a kind of day job career that is sort of like satisfying enough and not so demanding that you can pursue your passion uh, kind of in addition to it. But that is another uh, way to go about it that, that I think is, is worth kind of, if you can, if you could find that job that leaves you time for your other thing and that doesn't completely drain you and that maybe kind of satisfies your need to get out of the house and uh, have some social activity that, um, that that's another approach. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you brought this up because, you know, I think that, uh, and I've, I've brought this up on the show before, I mean, the world we live in, the internet, uh, the bubble that we're in kind of perpetuates this, you know, go leave your job and be an artist and, you know, be fulfilled and be Tim Ferriss, you know, mantra, yeah. which, you know, what we're finding more and more, not only is it not realistic for most people, uh, but the thought that, hey, that's what I'm supposed to do is making people really miserable. Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, thinking about like writers, you know, most writers today don't make a living from their writing and and so many creative writers have university jobs and um I think most of them would probably prefer to write full time, but that you know, a teaching job is a pretty good compromise and it lets them be close to the world of ideas and work with young writers and it's usually flexible enough that they can take summers off or or get kind of uh, you know, breaks to, to work on their own work. And, um, you know, I don't think everyone's lucky enough to be able to get that kind of job, but that, that I, for a long time have thought, you know, what would be the job <laughs> that would be, that would help pay the bills and kind of let me, um, do, do more stuff on the side. I think, you know, magazine editing for me was a way to get paid to write and to kind of be forced to, to do more of a writing and editing career. But then at a certain point it became, uh, it was so demanding that it became kind of like, once it kind of became a day job, it became a bad day job because it was so many hours and it sucked up all my uh, writing and editing energies. So I think it's a constant struggle to find that, you know, that balance. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the fact that you brought up that, that, you know, a lot of people probably will never make a living from their creative endeavors. I mean, the idea that you have to make a living from your creativity is, is, is ridiculous. Like, I think that there's value in and of it itself for if you're not doing it for anything other than the sake of doing it. And I, I've, got a, I've gotten some pushback on that from people who've read my book. They're like, well, that's all well and good, but this is a waste of time. And then, of course, there's something to be said for talent. Like, we've, you know, we've beat this like a dead horse on the show lately, but we said, you know, in, in a world with this much noise, talent rises to the top talent is exactly what kind of cuts above the clutter yeah 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 i mean i think you should a lot of the stuff you should go into it expecting not to make a living and <laughs> if you if you do then that's just gravy you know <laughs> yeah it's, it's a convenient byproduct i mean like you know one thing you know you're saying you're, there's it's a bit depressing to think but there are things like i know i am never going to make like a steven spielberg-esque film it's just mm -hmm. not one of my talents I, i'd be really surprised if i pulled off something like that in this lifetime um and, and I think that that's, you know, recognizing that I think can pull us out of this sort of misery that we've created uh, around, I mean, because I think we put such high expectations on ourselves by looking at what other people are doing and saying, oh, well, you know, Mason wrote a book, so now I have to go write a book. Uh, and that's, that to me is, believe it or not, I think that actually just totally destroys your creativity. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I think that if you're trying to, like, imitate some other career path or you're you're trying to like fit into some model of of what it means to be like a successful writer that you're just going to make yourself miserable um yeah i mean i think you have to ask yourself like what's the thing i would do whether i was getting paid for it or not and then how at the same time am i going to <laughs> maintain some kind of lifestyle that i can that i find acceptable mm -hmm. um you know i mean that to me yeah you know, somebody asked me recently like what's your definition of success or something and, and I thought that was a hard question but I've been thinking about it and I think it's like if I could just do work that I find interesting and creatively fulfilling and it's something that I can kind of build on over time that and I can like manage to have a reasonable quality of life that I think that that's that would be doing pretty well and that might be publishing new books or it might be doing something else but um you know I think everyone has to ask themselves like what is that uh like wh what's the right balance for them between what, what kind of lifestyle do they feel like they have to have and then and then what can they do to make to kind of meet that lifestyle and also leave themselves time for whatever it is that they find fulfilling mm -hmm. well i think that that uh that makes a perfect setup to to actually start getting into the book so let's shift gears a little bit and uh let, let's start talking about the book i mean some of these rituals are hilarious you're thinking wow these people are completely insane uh, so, I mean, talk to me about the, like, you know, some of the, cause, but I also imagine like a lot of these rituals are, because I remember reading somewhere, you were saying what you were searching for ideally is to figure out your sort of optimal rhythm and flow uh, when it comes to your creative endeavors. I mean, and I think, you know, after five years of writing and producing, I've realized that there are certain things that I absolutely have to do and have some sense of, of routine, even though I think we're, we kind of buy into this myth that, hey, you know, if I'm a creative, I can be completely free of routine. And yet, I found that I need an insane amount of structure to be able to produce on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people think that being an artist is about uh, freedom and about uh, waiting for inspiration to strike and about, you know, not worrying about uh, this sort of mundane world of schedules. But um, what I found in my research is that the opposite is true, is that most successful creative people uh, have uh, – often very strict routines and a very methodical approach to their work. And that, um, you know, this idea of inspiration is, uh, I, th I think inspiration exists. I think people in my book would certainly say that they've, they've had moments of inspiration, but that you really have to, it's more perspiration, you know, that, that you really do have to sit down and work on it every day. Mm -hmm. And that um, it's through the work that you get the ideas. It's not the other way around. It's not like you wait for the idea to strike and then you put in the work. Um, so, you know, it's funny, it's funny you mentioned the, the rituals being really crazy. And <laughs> I, I've got, I've gotten emails from people who say, um, some people have written to me and said, like, oh, I found your book so comforting is I have all these crazy uh, work habits of my own, and I was really happy to see that these famous creative people are just as crazy as me. And then other people have written and said, I realize that I can never be an artist because I'm not crazy enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of feel like um, I, I, I personally found a lot of these stories comforting because I think it shows that, you know, you think about these huge names, these, you know, the greatest artists of the last few hundred years as being sort of almost these kind of gods and that they, they must have had some kind of talent or some kind of ability that us like normal humans don't have. But I think that when you look at what their daily lives were like, it was really, 
it was a lot of labor and that they really struggled often on a, on a daily basis with, um, with, with moving their creative projects forward. And, um, you know, I find it kind of comforting that, that it, it's a matter of, of working toward these things and not being imbued with some magical ability that only a few people have. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Well, it's funny because, I mean, when you're describing that process, it sounds like a parallel to your own journey, which we've just been discussing, like almost identical. Oh, do you think so? <laughs> In a lot of ways. I mean, so let, let's actually get into some specifics uh, just so, you know, we have some examples to work with. Uh, I mean, you've profiled so many different people in this book, and I think it's I think it's really interesting that you had people like Sigmund Freud in here because I mean, in my mind, I would have never thought Sigmund Freud as a, a, an artist, uh, but you know, now that I've looked at this, you know, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. So let, let's talk specifics and get into some of the rituals, just so you know, people have potentially ideas that they could apply to their own lives. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, yeah, my goal with the book was to kind of. You know, a lot of people have asked me, like, oh, so what's the big secret? Like, uh, what's the takeaway? You know, like, what's the one thing? And, and I have to kind of say, you know, my goal wasn't to provide some, uh, you know, theory of creativity, you know, the, the unified theory of creative uh, work. It was, it was more to show, like, this huge variety of, um, of behaviors and working methods and habits that have enabled people to, to do their work over the last few hundred years and, and to just show how you know, everyone really had to figure out their own kind of method. And hopefully some of these methods will resonate with readers. Um, you know, you know, I personally am an early morning person. I, I tend to get my, my best work done, uh, first thing in the morning, right after waking up. And, um, so for me, like the stories about other early, early risers were, um, particularly interesting. Um, I, I especially enjoyed, I, I interviewed the novelist, um, Nicholson Baker. He, he's written a number of novels in the last uh, 15 years. And um, he talked about how he, like me, uh, works best first thing in the morning and that he's uh, devised this trick to basically get two mornings out of one day where he will wake up really early in the morning at like 4 a.m. and he'll kind of shuffle to his desk in the dark and he'll write for an hour or an hour and a half. And then he goes back to bed and he sleeps for another hour and a half or so. And then he wakes up again and does it all over again because he likes that kind of sleepy, uh, half awake, just out of bed sensation so much and finds that he writes in a, in a certain way then that he, um, he sort of has d devised the schedule to, to get that, to maximize that feeling during the day. And um, so I love those kind of stories. And, and, you know, I think people who like that kind of stuff will find lots of different examples like that here. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that you brought up the morning part. I, I may have to try that uh, two mornings in one day kind of thing. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I myself, you know, definitely am a much more of a morning person than I, I mean, I'm pretty useless after about noon. Uh, I find I, yeah, nothing, me too. Nothing creative comes out. There's like limited creative output that shows up. Uh, and I, I feel like I have a very limited time frame in which I can do really creative work. And then I feel like I'm more or less useless and in robot mode. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. And, you know, for what it's worth, a lot of people in the book, I think, found that, especially writers and composers, um, I, you know, I can talk about this later, but I feel like there is sort of a difference in the kind of brain power that different types of artists yeah, use. Yeah, actually, that sounds fascinating. Let's get into that. Yeah, okay. So, but first I was going to say that, like, especially the writers and the composers, um, you know, most of them say that, that two or three hours is, is, like, really the most that they can do of really focused um work and that anything more than that is um, unproductive or even counterproductive that they end up the next day having to go back and fix whatever it was they did during this kind of like, you know, they get sort of loopy and you're sort of like, you're, you're producing work that's not quite up to par. So, um, 
you know, I think for people out there who want to be writers, a little bit a day can actually be enough. You know, I think a lot of writers, if they can get in one or two good hours a day, that that ends up being enough to move the project forward. So um, that I think that is some solace for people who have to work a day job that, um, that you know, that it's these little, these little increments of time on a daily basis can really add up to something over, over the long haul. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I have no doubts about that. I mean, I think that, uh, it, you know, I wrote a post on Medium titled How Writing 1,000 Words a Day Changed My Life. And, I mean, even 1,000 seemed daunting to a lot of people. I said, don't start with 1,000. Start with 100. And yeah, build, yeah. build up. Because what I found is that after a certain point, you hit momentum. And it's really, really weird. But to me, it, I've gotten to the point where now so many of these things are habitual that I actually feel like something is off in my day if the routine of writing doesn't happen. Like, yeah. it's almost as bad to me as not brushing my teeth. I'd, be, I'd feel, like, you know, kind of odd the whole day if I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, in the book, uh, Gertrude Stein, I found, said that she only wrote for 30 minutes a day. And, you know, that was enough for her. And um, I think, like you say, if you set out to write 100 words a day, you might find that actually 1,000 words a day isn't that hard, that once you kind of build up to it. I think, you know, it... <clears throat> like you say, it's the power of, of repetition. Once you kind of train your mind to get into this this track, it, it can be really uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. So let's do this. Let's shift gears uh, a little bit. You brought up this idea of, of you know different parts of the brain and different <coughs> types of brain power based on the type of art you're creating. I mean, you know, between you and me, the only art you know between you and me and my thousands of listeners, the only art that I can create is interviews and writing. I've tried to draw before. Definitely not an artist in that sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm the same way. I'm, I am a writer and editor, but, you know, compiling the book, I was really struck by how writers and also composers, for the most part, <clears throat> found the work to be difficult. <laughs> you know, that it was often a real s struggle that, that, you know, that working was a real kind of like grinding your teeth and forcing yourself to stay at your desk and kind of get a good 15 minutes of flow maybe, and then kind of, you know, hit some block. And it was this sort of halting progress and, and often, you know, a very kind of painful activity, e even though they might hit these moments of, uh, you know, inspired composition. For the most part, it seemed like writing and editing and uh, composing were kind of a left brain activity and kind of, a, a, you know, a real struggle. Mm -hmm. But then by contrast, a lot of the painters and visual artists in the book uh, it's like the total opposite. They talk about how when they get in front of the canvas, it's like the hours evaporate, that they can be on their feet for three or four hours pacing back and forth, and they don't even know that it's gotten dark outside, and that it, it, was, it was the opposite problem. It was like they had to force themselves to stop working and kind of attend to their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a real difference there. You know, I think, um, I think that it's... It, it's it gets a little dangerous to talk about creativity as just one thing. So I think that there's a big divide there between this sort of left brain type and this sort of right brain visual type. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th it's funny you talk about sort of left and right brain because I think we always associate creativity being very much a right brain thing. Uh, but, you know, to hear somebody say, hey, there's a left brain component of this, that's actually a, an interesting perspective. So I want to talk about two things here. Uh, you know, one of the things I heard, I was listening to this interview with Robert Downey Jr., and he said, you know, as, uh, as an artist, exposing yourself to any art form actually causes you to grow. So I'm very curious, kind of, you know, one, can we, can we take away anything? If we're, for example, writers, can we take away anything from, you know, the filmmakers, the choreographers, the scientists, and, and, and apply it to our work? Um, and, and, you know, really mix both sort of creative... Uh, capacities. And then, of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of cross-pollination of uh, ideas from various creative fields. Mm, yeah, that's a good question about, I mean, I, I would, I would hope that you could take things away from reading about other people's creative activity, even if it's in a vastly different arena. I mean, I think, you know, in a lot of these little stories in the book, I think there's this real tension between the fact that on the one hand, you can't wait for inspiration to strike. You've got to really sit down every day and do the work. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, like I was saying before, it's not this thing about freedom. It's about, um, you know, putting in the hours and, and, and kind of getting into a, a routine and a ritual. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think there is a level at which you can't force it. You know, I think everyone's had the experience of sitting down and, you know, it's not like beautiful prose just tumbles out of your pen. And, and um, there is some level at which you have to be in a certain 
the right frame of mind, you know, in a, in a certain mindset to kind of access this creative expression and it doesn't always work, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. So I think that with these stories, you, you find that that ten, people are always kind of, um, kind of trying to find that sweet spot, uh, whether they're in the visual arts or writers or choreographers or cartoonists or any, any number of different kinds of creative fields. So, you know, I, I do think that there, there's a lot of common ground there. It's, it's not maybe so, so left and right. Like I was, you know, I think it's dangerous to get too caught up in the whole left brain, right brain thing. Um, so I think, I think that there is a lot of cross pollination for sure. Yeah, I you know it's it's interesting to hear you say that. I think that uh, there's no question. Like, it, it definitely there is something to be said for. Like, I I notice there are certain days when even though I'm you know ritualistic almost about it, there's certain days where everything just flows, and you're like, wow, that was really easy. And then there are other days where you're like, okay, that is just how did that like that's the worst thing I've ever written. I want to shoot myself. Like, I feel like burning <laughs> my notebooks on those days. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the biggest things that may be useful for people is to read about great creative minds and find that they had the same, the exact same experience. You know, so many uh, people who you think of as being these gods of, uh, of the arts, you know, had the same problem where they would want to, they would write something and it would be total garbage and they would throw away more pages than they would produce. And um, so, you know, I hope that the book kind of in, in these short bursts kind of captures just what it was, what it's like to, to do creative work on a daily basis. And that's often, you know, really, really difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, something actually came to my mind, Mason, while, while we're just sitting here. I mean, I'm sitting here staring at an iPhone on my desk and, you know, many of the people you profiled, I mean, they worked at a time when we didn't have, you know, all this sort of technological interruption and noise and I'm really curious. I mean, uh, this is you know more sort of like discussion ideas. I mean, what what are your thoughts on on how technology is is impacting our creativity? I mean, is it like is it hurting us in certain ways? Is it helping? And and you know where where do you draw the line between sort of saying okay, this is awesome that I can make a feature length film for my iPhone to okay, I can't think creatively because I'm just getting pinged in my brain all day long. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do think that it's more difficult than ever to kind of avoid distractions and, and carve out that that space where you're not being pulled in a, in a thousand directions. Um, you know, reading a lot of these stories in the book about people in the 17th and 18th and 19th century and how they would take hour long walks and then they would, uh, you know, sit at their desk for three hours and it, it you know, it's so. It's like amazing that people had so much time without being interrupted, uh, and I think it's really easy to feel kind of nostalgic for this pre-digital era. Um, so, you know, I think that practically speaking, I think people need to make a real effort to carve out some time during the day when they're not being distracted. When when you kind of let yourself just focus on on one thing, mm-hmm. and then you know, like you say, I think that the internet has obviously created. A, a ton of advantages for artists as well. And so it's, um, you know, you have kind of take the good with the bad for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, the reason I brought that up is, is I just, you know, one of the things I've noticed over the last, um, probably about two to three weeks, I, you know, I got into the habit of, of reading physical books again. Uh, You know, I've been an avid Kindle reader mainly because I could read much faster and so, you know, you guys have heard our interview with Danny Shapiro, and I may have referenced this once before on the show, but she kind of convinced me of the virtues of, of reading a physical book and, and starting my day not in front of the computer. And, and just, you know, I, there's, a, there's a collection of essays that she mentioned on the air called Writers on Loving and Leaving New York. Um, it, it's an anthology, and so I bought it uh, after she mentioned it. And I've been sitting every morning sort of just quietly thumbing through it, reading the sentences, and then afterwards, instead of opening up the computer, actually handwriting in my moleskin. And it was just a very, very different, like, what I tap into is something that I don't think I can get from the computer. Uh, I don't know if you find that to be the, the, the same for yourself, but it's, it's been really interesting to see, and I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around how to translate that into something useful for other people. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting, because I've actually lately been getting up and first thing in the morning, trying to to do some writing uh, longhand on just like a, a notepad and forcing myself not to check email. I mean, 
typically I will usually get up and like do a first pass at the email and make sure there's no <laughs> fires to put out. Cause I, I have some, I have, uh, you know, some freelance gigs to, to help pay the bills. And so I have various things that I need to kind of keep an eye on. But lately I've been saying, you know, whatever it is can probably wait at least an hour. So I try to like just do some work away from the computer. And I do think that it, you know, once you kind of let the compute, let the internet into your consciousness, you, it's kind of there in the back of your mind. And I think it's, it, there is something valuable about, um, doing something first thing, uh, that's not, you know, not tied into this, this thing that is always kind of nagging at you. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a way in which once you let it into your consciousness, it's always kind of uh, bouncing around in the back of your mind. And, uh, you know, I feel like when you send an email, you're always kind of slightly aware that somebody might be replying to that email and that you should check and see if, if there's another email follow up. And, 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 you know, one, it's like, I think it's worth putting that off as long as you can first thing in the day and, yeah. uh, and having some time without it. Cause once you open it up, it's like, it's there for the rest of the day. That's, that's a really interesting way of putting it. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's true. It's, it's in your consciousness and it's it kind of, I, I have found that after pretty much the moment I open email, it's really hard for me to get back to the place that I was at when it was just me <coughs> and then a cup of coffee. Like I can't yeah, no yeah. matter how hard I try. Like I couldn't even if I tried to shut it down in the afternoon, the fact that I've started it already, um, it, it makes it, it like make, it makes it almost impossible to get back to that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, a lot of mornings I would get up and I'd check my email and I'd be like, Okay, I don't have to deal with these things quite yet, so I can go do some writing, but th that, that sucks. You know, you're sort of like <laughs> just knowing that you've kind of like had these things that you're putting off till later and they're going to be there when you get back. It's kind of, it's already sort of degraded that your concentration and, and that, um, that kind of, for me, at least that kind of early morning, uh, sort of thoughtfulness that you, that you lose once you get sucked into the, that world. So, I mean, one thing I, I wrote a, a little piece for, um, one of the New York Times um, op-ed blogs uh, called Dr Draft. It's like a, a blog about the process of writing. And um, one of the things I noticed in my research was how many writers uh, in the pre-internet era, really, uh, for them, their correspondence was this, like, really valuable uh, kind of quasi-literary activity. You know, they would, they would often use their letters, their letter writing, reading and answering letters is a way to like warm up to or cool down from their sort of main writing project for the day. So you would have like Updike would answer a few letters in the morning before he would turn to his novel writing, or you would have all these other writers and, and, and even non-writers who had had kind of like certain portions of the day that was their time for dealing with correspondence. And it was something that they, they valued and enjoyed. Whereas you know, by contrast, all the contemporary people I spoke to were extremely wary of email and had the <laughs> same kind of problems that you and I are talking about. It was like, once you kind of let it into your consciousness, it was always there. And you had to be really careful not to check email too early in the day because it would distract you from your work. And it was this kind of constant nagging mm -hmm. distraction. So, um, you know, I think, <laughs> there's, unfortunately, I don't have a solution to that. But I think there is a really interesting uh, issue there that that correspondence was once a kind of useful uh corollary to your creative work and has now become this really dangerous temptation and um i think you know unfortunately we've kind of lost uh the good parts of corresponding in a lot of ways it's, it's become more like of a, a almost a to-do list rather than this sort of way to um to kind of rehearse your creative work or, or to work out ideas on the page yeah i mean yeah. i guess uh, you know maybe maybe the value there maybe the lesson there is is you know occasionally sit down and, and write a physical letter to somebody obviously not somebody who needs an email response from you uh, <laughs> yeah it's funny i wrote this blog post about how you know le letter writing has the art of letter writing is has died and people are all besieged by email and then of course got like a ton of emails from people <laughs> <laughs> including some like you said who pointing out that they actually do still write physical letters yeah. so some people do do that um and i think there's some value to that but uh, it's almost like you know i don't know the, the era has passed i somehow i can't quite get um really excited about trying to revive it <laughs> 
Well, let me let, let's, let me ask you about this. I mean, I, you know, people are going to listen to this and say, okay, you know, you guys have made an incredibly compelling case for all the morning people out there. But what about the night owls? I mean, what kinds of interesting things did you learn about them? Because I mean, so far it is it seems like our our entire case is you should be a morning person, and that's yeah, how you're yeah. creative. So let, let's talk about the flip side of this a little bit. Yeah, no, I don't want to give that impression at all. I mean, I really believe in this idea of. Um, Scientists, I think, call it chronotypes, the idea that certain people are more alert and uh, better able to focus at certain times of the day. That, that seems to be a real thing. And, um, you know, in my research, it, it did skew a little bit more toward the morning people, um, and that may be a confirmation by, bias on my, <laughs> my part. Um, but there were also a lot of people who swore that they could only work at night, um, you know, People like uh, the French novelist Proust is famous for um, writing only at night. Uh, uh, Kafka was a nighttime writer, um, the short story writer. And Beatty has said that she can't really get going until about 10 or 11 at night. Um, there are a lot of examples. And um, so I think if people feel like they're a night person, they're probably right. I think that there, there really is uh, something to the idea that different people have this mental energy at different times of the day. I mean, uh, James Joyce said he could only write in the afternoon. So I don't think it's just early morning and nighttime people. Um, and I think that's one of the tricks is if you're trying to be more productive or to get your creative project uh, kicked into gear, I think first kind of figuring out and recognizing what part of the day is your kind of magic hour is really crucial. And, and then doing whatever you can to arrange your schedule so that you can take advantage of those hours um, is like kind of the, the baseline uh, thing for, for, for kind of taking advantage of your schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that so much of that comes down to awareness, right? I mean, we're, we're like, we we're talking about earlier in such a fast paced world that like, you got to just slow down and recognize that, Hey, wait a minute. I just had a, a you know, an hour straight of, of some really productive creative work. Well, maybe this is the hour in which I should be doing that work every single day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so easy when you're on the computer and, and doing putting out fires and dealing with email and stuff to feel like you're being productive. I mean, you are kind of being productive, and it feel, it, often it feels good, and it can be kind of addictive. I mean, if you were to step away and, say, stare at a blank piece of paper for half an hour, that might feel like a waste of time, but that might actually be the thing that you should be doing. And, you know, there's sort of like the, the daytime internet uh, – to-do list, email kind of world is sort of always there. And I feel like people, if they could figure out when it is that they have the best kind of mental energy for their creative project and then, you know, set aside that time and kind of cordon it off and, and make it sacrosanct, even if it might mean like sitting in a room by all intents and per you know, to the outside observer, not really doing anything, <laughs> it, that, that, that can over time build into something, you know? So yeah. I think... I think that, that that's a, the trick. Well, I mean, the I trick. think as creatives, that, that is like another common fear. It's like I'm sitting around doing nothing. I mean, like I, I can't imagine if, if somebody said, hey, I want to come and observe you work for a day. I'd be like, do you want to sit around and watch me do nothing for a day? That's going to be really traumatizing. Like I always say it's like, you know, if you came and spent a day with me, you'd basically think I did nothing all day. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> Cause I feel that way sometimes too. You know, it's like, for, I mean, there's a, a, people a lot of times ask about like procrastination and if it's valuable and then there's definitely a fair amount of procrastination in the book. And, um, I definitely do a fair amount of procrastination and I do think, uh, it, there is a little bit of value in that. It's, it's like, you're kind of, uh, working yourself up into this state where you can finally, get something down. You know, it's like you're almost creating a little bit of anxiety and, um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's like the, the, the really good work, the, the really like kind of lasting, valuable creative work, um, is not easy to come by and you kind of have to do whatever you can. And sometimes it's doing nothing and sometimes it's putting things off and sometimes it's other weird rituals that kind of, um, get you into that right space where you can get some really valuable stuff down. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think this, this makes a perfect setup and we're getting close to an hour. So, let, let, so you know, you brought up the idea of really good creative work and obviously, I mean, everybody you've profiled in this book are, are sort of iconic figures, right? Like threat. I mean, they've made a name for, for themselves. They're going to go down in history. You know, we, we basically, I mean, you've written a book about them, so obviously they've done something right. Uh, I'm really curious. I mean, through studying all these people, uh, you know, I mean, in some ways, what you and I do is very similar, right? I mean, my, my whole day is spent talking to modern contemporaries, uh, co contemporary creatives, and, you know, kind of learning how they do what they do. 
And I'm really curious if you could isolate what you think it is that made certain people successful uh, as creatives. Because, I mean, what we know as anybody who does creative work, that our work comes with no guarantees. Like, we, you know, you choose the, you know, Danny Shapiro said, this life chooses us, which I, I really thought, yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm curious if you if you saw anything that made like across all these people that you researched, was there anything that you could say that, okay, there is a certain characteristic that people have that as creatives that, you know, enables them to succeed versus linger in obscurity forever? Well, I think it was, I mean, it's interesting you say linger in obscurity because I almost think that the thing was the willingness to keep laboring in obscurity if that's what it took. You know, so many of these people didn't know that they were going to be later on considered great artists or great minds. Um, Some of them had recognition in their lifetimes and some didn't. I think it was that they were you know, they they're, they had found a project that they were willing to keep working on regardless of whether it afforded them a nice lifestyle or whether they had to live in a kind of semi-poverty and regardless of whether they were recognized or made money. Um, it, you know, it's like it's... They all were really obsessed with their creative problem, and I think that's what really brought them together and, and that that it's the willingness to keep working away at it over your whole lifetime that, that really uh, set them apart. And so, so many of them ultimately had great breakthroughs and had recognition, but in, on the, on a daily basis and for huge swaths of their lives, you know, to the outsider, it would seem like they're just wasting their time. And I think it was the, the willingness to keep working at it, even when it it might seem like they're failures that really set them apart. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that you brought up the idea of just keep working on it, but not, I mean, not like, you know, we talk about five, 10 years, you know, the overnight success, but I mean, you talk about a lifetime. I mean, and I, you know, one of the things that I am realizing is there are a lot of creative people who never saw the impact of their work before they died. And you're kind of like, that's, that's crazy. But I think it's like you said, I think it comes down to this just burning desire that you can't not do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah i mean i think it's a lot like what you said it's sort of the idea that it chooses you so i mean if you're doing something out of some kind of obligation or because you think it's some kind of shortcut um i think you know you're just kind of setting yourself up for trouble um it should be something that you that you want to do and um i think finding that thing is really in some ways the hard part and um yeah (laughs) yeah. (laughs) you know uh the there's no easy answer to that unfortunately well, Mason, uh, this has been really uh, just eye-opening and really cool and, and a lot of fun. I mean, you know, for those of you guys who haven't checked out this book, uh, How Artists Work Daily Rituals, uh, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I'm, you know, it, it's cool because it's one of those things that you can pick up any day as a sort of reference book. I mean, it's one of the things that you know, I, I pretty much will be sitting on my desk uh, going forward. Uh, so, Mason, I'm going to close with my final question. You know, it's funny because I had been saying for hundreds of interviews I couldn't come up with a new question to close with. But uh, <laughs> you've you've really, I mean, you've studied people who, for all intents and purposes, are unmistakable. Like, you know, you look at their work and you recognize it. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm curious, uh, in a world with this much noise, uh, how do you become unmistakable? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> uh I, you know, I think it ties back to what we've been talking about. I think it's to find your thing, your, it, you know, you could call it your niche or whatever it is, your, your project, the, the area in your um, field where you feel most able to kind of devote long-term energy and, and to investigate, you know, over many years and, and to kind of like make a contribution and, um, and then to, to to work away at that, you know, to to, um, to to find that area and then kind of keep building on it. I think uh, ultimately is is where you you really distinguish yourself. Awesome. Well, Mason, uh, this has been amazing. I, like I said, uh, I can't thank you enough for for taking the time to join us and share some of your insights with our listeners here at the Unmistakable Creative. Yeah, thank you so much for for the time. I I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, for those of you guys listening, we'll wrap the show with that. You've been listening to the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. Visit our website at unmistakablecreative.com and get access to over 400 interviews in our archives. 